Chapter One of By What Authority? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carol Pelster. By What Authority? By Robert Hugh Benson. Part One, Chapter One The Situation to the casual londoner who lounged intolerant and impatient at the blacksmith's door while a horse was shod or a cracked spoke mended great keens seemed but a poor backwater of a place compared with the rush of the brighton road eight miles to the east from which he had turned off or the whirling cauldron of london city twenty miles to the north towards which he was travelling the triangular green with its stocks and horse-pond overlooked by the grey benignant church tower seemed a tame exchange for seething cheapside and the crowded ways about the temple or whitehall and it was strange to think that the solemn-faced rustics who stared respectfully at the gorgeous stranger were of the same human race as the quick-eyed voluble townsmen who chattered and laughed and grimaced over the news that came up daily from the continent and was tossed to and fro embroidered and discredited alternately all day long and yet the great waves and movements that rising in the hearts of kings and politicians or in the sudden strokes of divine providence swept over europe and england eventually always rippled up into this placid country village and the lives of master musgrave who had retired upon his earnings and of old martin who cobbled the ploughman's shoes were definitely affected and changed by the plans of far-away scottish gentlemen and the hopes and fears of the inhabitants of south europe through all the earlier part of elizabeth's reign the menace of the spanish empire brooded low on the southern horizon and a responsive mutter of storm sounded now and again from the north where mary stuart reigned over men's hearts if not their homes and lovers of secular england shook their heads and were silent as they thought of their tiny country so rent with internal strife and ringed with danger for great keens however as for most english villages and towns at this time secular affairs were so deeply and intricately interwoven with ecclesiastical matters that none dared decide on the one question without considering its relation to the other and ecclesiastical affairs too touched them more personally than any other since every religious change scored a record of itself presently within the church that was as familiar to them as their own cottages on none had the religious changes fallen with more severity than on the maxwell family that lived in the hall at the upper and southern end of the green old sir nicholas though his convictions had survived the tempest of unrest and trouble that had swept over england and he had remained a convinced and a stubborn catholic yet his spiritual system was sore and inflamed within him to his simple and obstinate soul it was an irritating puzzle as to how any man could pass from the old to a new faith and he had been known to lay his whip across the back of a servant who had professed a desire to try the new religion his wife a stately lady a few years younger than himself did what she could to keep her lord quiet and to save him from incurring by his indiscretion any further penalties beyond the enforced journeys before the commission and the fines inflicted on all who refused to attend their parish church so the old man devoted himself to his estates and the further improvement of the house and gardens and to the inculcation of sound religious principles into the minds of his two sons who were living at home with their parents and strove to hold his tongue and his hand in public the elder of these two mr james as he was commonly called was rather a mysterious personage to the village and to such neighbours as they had he was often in town 
and when at home although extremely pleasant and courteous never talked about himself and seemed to be only very moderately interested in the estate and the country life generally this coupled with the fact that he would presumably succeed his father gave rise to a good deal of gossip and even some suspicion his younger brother hubert was very different passionately attached to sport and to outdoor occupations a fearless rider and in every way a kindly frank lad of about eighteen years old the fifth family member lady maxwell's sister mistress margaret torridon was a quiet-faced old lady seldom seen abroad and round whom as round her eldest nephew hung a certain air of mystery the difficulties of this catholic family were considerable sir nicholas religious sympathies were of course wholly with the spiritual side of spain and all that that involved while his intense love of england gave him a horror of the southern empire that the sturdiest patriot might have envied and so with his attitude towards mary stuart and her french background while his whole soul rose in loathing against the crime of darnley's murder to which many of her enemies proclaimed her accessory it was kindled at the thought that in her or her child lately crowned as james the sixth of scotland lay the hope of a future catholic succession and this religious sympathy was impassioned by the memory of an interview a few years ago when he had kissed that gracious white hand and looked into those alluring eyes and kneeling stammered out in broken french his loyalty and his hopes whether it was by her devilish craft as her enemies said or her serene and limpid innocence as her friends said or by a maddening compound of the two as later students have said at least she had made the heart and confidence of old sir nicholas her own but there were troubles more practical than these mental struggles it was a misery beyond describing to this old man and his wife to see the church where once they had worshipped and received the sacraments given over to what was in their opinion a novel heresy and the charge of a schismatic minister there in the maxwell chapel lay the bones of their catholic ancestors and there they had knelt to adore and receive their saviour and now for them all was gone and the light was gone out in the temple of the lord in the days of the previous rector matters were not so desperate it had been their custom to receive from his hands at the altar rail of the church hosts previously consecrated at the rectory for the incumbent had been an old marian priest who had not scrupled so as to relieve his catholic sheep of the burden of recusancy while he fed his protestant charges with bread and wine from the communion table but now all that was past and the entire family was compelled year by year to slip off into hampshire shortly before easter for their annual duties and the parish church that their forefathers had built endowed and decorated knew them no more but the present rector the rev george dent was far from a bigot and the papists were more fortunate than perhaps in their bitterness they recognized for the minister was one of the rising anglican school then strange and unfamiliar but which has now established itself as the main representative section of the church of england he welcomed the effect but not the rise of the reformation and rejoiced that the incrustations of error had been removed from the lantern of the faith but he no less sincerely deplored the fanaticism of the puritan and genevan faction he exulted to see england with a church truly her own at last adapted to her character and freed from the avarice and tyranny of a foreign despot who had assumed prerogatives to which he had no right 
but he reverenced the episcopate he wore the prescribed dress he used the thick singing cakes for the communion and he longed for the time when nation and church should again be one when the nation should worship through a church of her own shaping and the church share the glory and influence of her lusty partner and patron but mrs dent had little sympathy with her husband's views she had assimilated the fiery doctrines of the genevan refugees and to her mind her husband was balancing himself to the loss of all dignity and consistency in an untenable position between the popish priesthood on the one side and the gospel ministry on the other it was an unbearable thought to her that through her husband's weak disposition and principles his chief parishioners should continue to live within a stone's throw of the rectory in an assured position of honour and in personal friendliness to a minister whose ecclesiastical status and claims they disregarded the rector's position then was difficult and trying no less in his own house than elsewhere the third main family in the village was that of the norrises who lived in the dower house that stood in its own grounds and gardens a few hundred yards to the northwest of the village green the house had originally been part of the hall estate but it had been sold some fifty years before the present owner mr henry norris a widower lived there with his two children isabel and anthony and did his best to bring them up in his own religious principles he was a devout and cultivated puritan who had been affected by the new learning in his youth and had conformed joyfully to the religious changes that took place in edward's reign he had suffered both anxiety and hardships in mary's reign when he had travelled abroad in the protestant countries and made the acquaintance of many of the foreign reformers beza calvin and even the great melanchthon himself it was at this time too that he had lost his wife it had been a great joy to him to hear of the accession of elizabeth and the re-establishment of a religion that was sincerely his own and he had returned immediately to england with his two little children and settled down once more at the dower house here his whole time that he could spare from his children was divided between prayer and the writing of a book on the eucharist and as his children grew up he more and more retired into himself and silence and communing with god and devoted himself to his book it was beginning to be a great happiness to him to find that his daughter isabel now about seventeen years old was growing up into active sympathy with his principles and that the passion of her soul as of his was a tender deep-lying faith towards god which could exist independently of outward symbols and ceremonies but unlike others of his school he was happy too to notice and encourage friendly relations between lady maxwell and his daughter since he recognized the sincere and loving spirit of the old lady beneath her superstitions and knew very well that her friendship would do for the girl what his own love could not the other passion of isabel's life at present lay in her brother anthony who was about three years younger than herself and who was just now more interested in his falcons and pony than in all the religious systems and human relationships in the world except perhaps in his friendship for hubert who besides being three or four years older than himself cared for the same things and so relations between the hall and dower house were all that they should be and the path that ran through the gardens of the one and the yew hedge and orchard of the other was almost as well trodden as if all still formed one estate as for the village itself it was exceedingly difficult to gauge accurately the theological atmosphere the rector despaired of doing so it was true that at easter the entire population except the maxwells and their dependents received communion in the parish church 
or at least professed their willingness and intention to do so unless prevented by some accident of the preceding week but it was impossible to be blind to the fact that many of the old beliefs lingered on and that there was little enthusiasm for the new system rumours broke out now and again that the catholics were rising in the north that elizabeth contemplated a spanish or french marriage with a return to the old religion that mary stuart would yet come to the throne and with each such report there came occasionally a burst of joy in unsuspected quarters old martin for example had been overheard so a zealous neighbour reported blessing our lady aloud for her mercies when a passing traveller had insisted that a religious league was in progress of formation between france and spain and that it was only a question of months as to when mass should be said again in every village church but then on the following sunday the cobbler's voice had been louder than all in the metrical psalm and on the monday he had paid a morning visit to the rectory to satisfy himself on the doctrine of justification and had gone again praising god and not our lady for the godly advice received but again three years back just before mr dent had come to the place there had been a solemn burning on the village green of all such muniments of superstition as had not been previously hidden by the priest and sir nicholas and in the rejoicings that accompanied this return to pure religion practically the whole agricultural population had joined some justices had ridden over from east grinstead to direct this rustic reformation and had reported favourably to the new rector on his arrival of the zeal of his flock the great rood they told him with saints mary and john four great massy angels the statue of saint christopher the vernicle a brocade set of mass vestments and a purple cope had perished in the flames and there had been no lack of hands to carry faggots and now the rector found it difficult to reconcile the zeal of his parishioners which indeed he privately regretted with the sudden and unexpected lapses into superstition such as was mr martin's gratitude to our lady and others of which he had had experience as regards the secular politics of the outside world great keens took but little interest it was far more a matter of concern whether mass or morning prayer was performed on sunday than whether a german bridegroom could be found for elizabeth or whether she would marry the duke of anjou and more important than either were the infinitesimal details of domestic life whether mary was guilty or not whether her supporters were rising whether the shadow of spain chilled the hearts of men in london whose affair it was to look after such things yet the cows must be milked and the children washed and the falcons fed and it was these things that formed the foreground of life whether the sky were stormy or sunlit and so as the autumn of sixty nine crept over the woods in flame and russet and the sound of the sickle was in folks ears the life at great keynes was far more tranquil than we should fancy who look back on those stirring days the village lying as it did out of the direct route between any larger towns was not so much affected by the gallop of the couriers or the slow creeping rumours from the continent as villages that lay on lines of frequent communication so the simple life went on and isabel went about her business in mrs carroll's still room and anthony rode out with the harriers and sir nicholas told his beads in his room all with nearly as much serenity as if scotland were fairyland and spain a dream End of chapter one chapter two of by what authority by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain the hall and the house anthony norris who was now about fourteen 
went up to king's college cambridge in october he was closeted long with his father the night before he left and received from him much sound religious advice and exhortation and in the morning after an almost broken-hearted good-bye from isabel he rode out with his servant following on another horse and leading a pack-horse on the saddle of which the falcons swayed and staggered and up the curving drive that led round into the village green he was a good-hearted and wholesome-minded boy and left a real ache behind him in the dower house isabel indeed ran up to his room after she had seen his feathered cap disappear at a trot through the gate leaving her father in the hall and after shutting and latching the door threw herself on his bed and sobbed her heart out they had never been long separated before for the last three years he had gone over to the rectory morning by morning to be instructed by mr dent but now although he would never make a great scholar his father thought it well to send him up to cambridge for two or three years that he might learn to find his own level in the world anthony himself was eager to go if the truth must be told he fretted a little against the restraints of even such a moderate puritan household as that of his father's it was a considerable weariness to anthony to kneel in the hall on a fresh morning while his father read even though with fervour and sincerity long extracts from christian prayers and holy meditations collected by the rev henry bull when the real world as anthony knew it laughed and rippled and twinkled outside in the humming summer air of the lawn and orchard or to have to listen to godly discourses however edifying to elder persons just at the time when the ghost moth was beginning to glimmer in the dusk and the heavy trout who sucked down his supper in the glooming pool in the meadow below the house his very sports too which his father definitely encouraged were obviously displeasing to the grave divines who haunted the house so often from saturday to monday and spoke of high doctrinal matters at meal-times when so anthony thought lighter subjects should prevail they were not interested in his horse and anthony never felt quite the same again towards one good minister who in a moment of severity called eliza the glorious peregrine that sat on the boy's wrist and shook her bells a vanity and so anthony trotted off happy enough on his way to cambridge of which he had heard much from mr dent and where although there too were divines and theology there were boys as well who acted plays hunted with the hounds and did not call high-bred hawks vanities isabel was very different while anthony was cheerful and active like his mother who had died in giving him life she on the other hand was quiet and deep like her father she was growing up if not into actual beauty at least into grace and dignity but there were some who thought her beautiful she was pale with dark hair and the great grey eyes of her father and she loved and lived in anthony from the very difference between them she frankly could not understand the attraction of sport and the things that pleased her brother she was afraid of the hawks and liked to stroke a horse and kiss his soft nose better than to ride him but after all anthony liked to watch the towering bird and to hear and indeed increase the thunder of the hoofs across the meadows behind the stomping hawk and so she did her best to like them too and she was often torn two ways by her sympathy for the partridge on the one hand as it sped low and swift across the standing corn with that dread shadow following and her desire on the other hand that anthony should not be disappointed but in the deeper things of the spirit too there was a wide difference between them as anthony fidgeted and sighed through his chair back morning and evening 
Isabel's soul soared up to God on the wings of those sounding phrases. She had inherited all her father's tender piety, and lived, like him, on the most intimate terms with the spiritual world. And though of course by training she was a Puritan, by character she was a Puritan too. As a girl of fourteen she had gone with Anthony to see the cleansing of the village temple. They had stood together at the west end of the church, a little timid at the sight of that noisy crowd in the quiet house of prayer. But she had felt no disapproval at that fierce vindication of truth. Her father had taught her, of course, that the purest worship was that which was only spiritual. And while, since childhood, she had seen Sunday by Sunday the great rood overhead, she had never paid it any but artistic attention. The men had the ropes round it now, and it was swaying violently to and fro. And then, even as the children watched, a tie had given, and the great cross, with its pathetic wide-armed figure, had toppled forward towards the nave, and then crashed down on the pavement. A fanatic ran out and furiously kicked the thorn-crowned head twice, splintering the hair and the features, and cried out on it as an idol. And yet Isabel, with all her tenderness, felt nothing more than a vague regret that a piece of carving so ancient and so delicate should be broken. But when the work was over and the crowd and Anthony with them had stamped out, directed by the justices, dragging the figures and the old vestments with them to the green, she had seen something which touched her heart much more. She passed up alone under the screen which they had spared, to see what had been done in the chancel, and as she went she heard a sobbing from the corner near the priest's door, and there, crouched forward on his face, crying and moaning quietly, was the old priest, who had been rector of the church for nearly twenty years. He had somehow held on in Edward's time, in spite of difficulties, had thanked God and the court of heaven with a full heart for the accession of Mary, had prayed and deprecated the divine wrath at the return of the Protestant religion with Elizabeth, but yet had somehow managed to keep the old faith alight for eight years more, sometimes evading, sometimes resisting, and sometimes conforming to the march of events in hopes of better days. But now the blow had fallen, and the old man, too ill-instructed to hear the accents of new truth in the shouting of that noisy crowd and the crash of his images was on his knees before the altar where he had daily offered the holy sacrifice through all those troublous years faithful to what he believed to be god's truth now bewailing and moaning the horrors of that day, and, it is to be feared, unchristianly calling down the vengeance of God upon his faithless flock. This shocked and touched Isabel far more than the destruction of the images, and she went forward timidly and said something, but the old man turned on her a face of such misery and anger that she had run straight out of the church and joined Anthony as he danced on the green. On the following Sunday the old priest was not there, and a fervent young minister from London had taken his place and preached a stirring sermon on the life and times of Josiah, and Isabel had thanked God on her knees after the sermon for that he had once more vindicated his awful name and cleansed his house for a pure worship. But the very centre of Isabel's religion was the love of the Saviour. The Puritans of those early days were very far from holding a negative or colourless faith. Not only was their belief delicately dogmatic to excess, 
but it all centred round the person of the lord jesus christ and isabel had drunk in this faith from her father's lips and from devotional books which he gave her as far back as she could remember anything her love for the saviour was even romantic and passionate it seemed to her that he was as much a part of her life and of her actual experience as anthony or her father certain places in the lanes about and certain spots in the garden were sacred and fragrant to her because her lord had met her there it was indeed a trouble to her sometimes that she loved anthony so much and to her mind it was a less worthy kind of love altogether it was kindled and quickened by such little external details by the sight of his boyish hand brown with the sun and scarred by small sporting accidents such as the stroke of his bird's beak or talons or by the very outline of the pillow where his curly head had rested only an hour or two ago whereas her love for christ was a deep and solemn passion that seemed to well not out of his comeliness or even his marred face or pierced hands but out of his wide encompassing love that sustained and clasped her at every moment of her conscious attention to him and that woke her soul to ecstasy at moments of high communion these two loves then one so earthly one so heavenly but both so sweet every now and then seemed to her to be in slight conflict in her heart and lately a third seemed to be rising up out of the plane of sober and quiet affections such as she felt for her father and still further complicating the apparently encountering claims of love to god and man isabel grew quieter in a few minutes and lay still following anthony with her imagination along the lane that led to the london road and then presently she heard her father calling and went to the door to listen isabel he said come down hubert is in the hall she called out that she would be down in a moment and then going across to her own room she washed her face and came downstairs there was a tall pleasant-faced lad of about her own age standing near the open door that led into the garden and he came forward nervously as she entered i came back last night mistress isabel he said and heard that anthony was going this morning but i am afraid i am too late she told him that anthony had just gone yes he said i came to say good-bye but i came by the orchard and so we missed one another isabel asked a word or two about his visit to the north and they talked for a few minutes about a rumour that hubert had heard of a rising on behalf of mary but hubert was shy and constrained and isabel was still a little tremulous at last he said he must be going and then suddenly remembered a message from his mother ah he said i was forgetting my mother wants you to come up this evening if you have time father is away and my aunt is unwell and is upstairs isabel promised she would come father is at chichester went on hubert before the commission but we do not expect him back till to-morrow a shadow passed across isabel's face i'm sorry she said the fact was that sir nicholas had again been summoned for recusancy it was an expensive matter to refuse to attend church and sir nicholas probably paid not less than two hundred pounds or three hundred pounds a year for the privilege of worshipping as his conscience bade in the evening isabel asked her father's leave to be absent after supper and then drawing on her hood walked across in the dusk to the hall hubert was waiting for her at the boundary door between the two properties father's come back he said but my mother wants you still they went on together passed round the cloister wing to the south of the house the bell turret over the inner hall and the crowded roofs stood up against the stars 
as they came up the curving flight of shallow steps from the garden to the tall doorway that led into the hall it was a pleasant wide high room panelled with fresh oak and hung with a little old tapestry here and there and a few portraits a staircase rose out of it to the upper story it had a fret ceiling with flower de luce and rose pendants and on the walls between the tapestries hung a few antlers and pieces of armour morions and breastplates with a pair of pikes or halberds here and there a fire had been lighted in the great hearth as the evenings were chilly and sir nicholas was standing before it still in his riding dress pouring out resentment and fury to his wife who sat in a tall chair at her embroidery she turned silently and held out a hand to isabel who came and stood beside her while hubert went and sat down near his father sir nicholas scarcely seemed to notice their entrance beyond glancing up for a moment under his fierce white eyebrows but went on growling out his wrath he was a fine rosy man with a grey moustache and pointed beard and a thick head of hair and he held in his hand his flat riding cap and his whip with which from time to time he cut at his boot it was monstrous i told the fellow that a man should be hailed from his home like this to pay a price for his conscience the religion of my father and his father and all our fathers was good enough for me and why in god's name should the catholic have to pay who had never changed his faith while every heretic went free and then to that some stripling of a clerk told me that a religion that was good enough for the queen's grace should be good enough for her loyal subjects too but my lord silenced him quickly and then i went at them again and all my lord would do was to nod his head and smile at me as if i were a child and then he told me that it was a special commission all for my sake and sir arthur's who was there too my dear well well the end was that i had to pay for their cursed religion sweetheart sweetheart said lady maxwell glancing at isabel well i paid went on sir nicholas but i showed them thank god what i was for as we came out sir arthur and i together what should we see but another party coming in pursuivant and all and in the mid of them that priest who was with us last july well well we'll leave his name alone him that said he was a priest before them all in september and i went down on my knees thank god and sir arthur went down on his and we asked his blessing before them all and he gave it us and oh my lord was red and white with passion that was not wise sweetheart said lady maxwell tranquilly the priest will have suffered for it afterwards well well grumbled sir nicholas a man cannot always think but we showed them that catholics were not ashamed of their religion yes and we got the blessing too well but here is supper waiting said my lady and isabel too whom you have not spoken to yet sir nicholas paid no attention ah uh, but that was not all he went on savagely striking his boot again at the end of all who should i see but that oh, that damned rogue whom god reward and he turned and spat into the fire topcliffe there he was bowing to my lord and the commissioners when i think of that man he said when i think of that man and sir nicholas kindly old passionate face grew pale and lowering with fury and his eyebrows bent themselves forward and his lower lip pushed itself out and his hand closed tremblingly on his whip his wife laid down her embroidery and came to him there sweetheart she said taking his cap and whip now sit down and have supper and leave that man to god sir nicholas grew quiet again and after saying a word or two of apology to isabel left the room to wash before he sat down to supper mistress isabel does not know who topcliffe is said hubert hush my son said his mother 
your father does not like his name to be spoken presently sir nicholas returned and sat down to supper gradually his good nature returned and he told them what he had seen in chichester and the talk he had heard how it was reported to his lordship the bishop that the old religion was still the religion of the people's hearts how for example at lindfield they had all the images and the altar furniture hidden underground and at battle too and that the mass could be set up again at a few hours notice and that the chalices had not been melted down into communion cups according to the orders issued and so on and that at west grinstead moreover the blessed sacrament was there still praise god yes and was going to remain there he spoke freely before isabel and yet he remembered his courtesy too and did not abuse the new-fangled religion as he thought it in her presence or seek in any way to trouble her mind if ever in an excess of anger he was carried away in his talk his wife would always check him gently and he would always respond and apologize to isabel if he had transgressed good manners in fact he was just a fiery old man who could not change his religion even at the bidding of his monarch and could not understand how what was right twenty years ago was wrong now isabel herself listened with patience and tenderness and awe too because she loved and honoured this old man in spite of the darkness in which he still walked he also told them in lower tones of a rumour that was persistent at chichester that the duke of norfolk had been imprisoned by the queen's orders and was to be charged with treason and that he was at present at burnham in mr wentworth's house under the guard of sir henry neville if this was true as indeed it turned out to be later it was another blow to the catholic cause in england but sir nicholas was of a sanguine mind and pooh-poohed the whole affair even while he related it and so the evening passed in talk when sir nicholas had finished supper they all went upstairs to my lady's withdrawing-room on the first floor this was always a strange and beautiful room to isabel it was panelled like the room below but was more delicately furnished and a tall harp stood near the window to which my lady sang sometimes in a sweet tremulous old voice while sir nicholas nodded at the fire isabel too had had some lessons here from the old lady but even this mild vanity troubled her puritan conscience a little sometimes then the room too had curious and attractive things in it a high niche in the oak over the fireplace held a slender image of mary and her holy child and from the child's fingers hung a pair of beads isabel had a strange sense sometimes as if this holy couple had taken refuge in that niche when they were driven from the church but it seemed to her in her steadier moods that this was a superstitious fancy and had the nature of sin this evening the old lady went to her harp while isabel sat down near her in the wide window-seat and looked out over the dark lawn where the white dial glimmered like a phantom and thought of anthony again sir nicholas went and stretched himself before the fire and closed his eyes for he was old and tired with his long ride and hubert sat down in a dark corner near him whence he could watch isabel after a few rippling chords my lady began to sing a song by sir thomas wyatt whom she and sir nicholas had known in their youth and which she had caused to be set to music by some foreign chapel-master it was a sorrowful little song with the title he seeketh comfort in patience and possibly she chose it on purpose for this evening patience for i have wrong and dare not show wherein patience shall be my song since truth can nothing win patience then for this fit hereafter comes not yet while she sang she thought no doubt of the foolish brave courtier who lacked patience in spite of his singing and lost his head for it her voice shook once or twice 
and old sir nicholas shook his drowsy head when she had finished and said god rest him and then fell fast asleep then he presently awoke as the others talked in whispers and joined in too and they talked of anthony and what he would find at cambridge and of alderman marrett and his house off cheapside where anthony would lie that night and of such small and tranquil topics and left fiercer questions alone and so the evening came to an end and isabel said good-night and went downstairs with hubert and out into the garden again i am sorry that sir nicholas has been so troubled she said to hubert as they turned the corner of the house together why cannot we leave one another alone and each worship god as we think fit hubert smiled in the darkness to himself i am afraid queen mary did not think it could be done either he said but then mistress isabel he went on i am glad that you feel that religion should not divide people surely not she said so long as they love god then you think began hubert and then stopped isabel turned to him yes she asked nothing said hubert they had reached the door in the boundary wall by now and isabel would not let him come further with her and bade him good-night but hubert still stood with his hand on the door and watched the white figure fade into the dusk and listened to the faint rustle of her skirt over the dry leaves and then when he heard at last the door of the dower house open and close he sighed to himself and went home isabel heard her father call from his room as she passed through the hall and went in to him as he sat at his table in his furred gown with his books about him to bid him good-night and receive his blessing he lifted his hand for a moment to finish the sentence he was writing and she stood watching the quill move and pause and move again over the paper in the candlelight until he laid the pen down and rose and stood with his back to the fire smiling down at her he was a tall slender man surprisingly upright for his age with a delicate bearded scholar's face the little plain ruff round his neck helped to emphasize the fine sensitiveness of his features and the hands which he stretched out to his daughter were thin and veined well my daughter he said looking down at her with his kindly grey eyes so like her own and holding her hands have you had a good evening sir she asked he nodded briskly and you child he asked yes sir she said smiling up at him and was sir nicholas there she told him what had passed and how sir nicholas had been fined again for his recusancy and how lady maxwell had sung one of sir thomas wyatt's songs and was no one else there he asked yes father hubert ah and did hubert come home with you only as far as the gate father i would not let him come further her father said nothing but still looked steadily down into her eyes for a moment and then turned and looked away from her into the fire you must take care he said gently remember he is a papist born and bred and that he has a heart to be broken too she felt herself steadily flushing and as he turned again towards her dropped her eyes you will be prudent and tender i know he added i trust you wholly isabel then he kissed her on the forehead and laid his hand on her head and looked up as the puritan manner was may the god of grace bless you my daughter and make you faithful to the end and then he looked into her eyes again smiled and nodded and she went out leaving him standing there mr norris had begun to fear that the boy loved isabel but as yet he did not know whether isabel understood it or even was aware of it the marriage difficulties of catholics and protestants were scarcely yet existing and certainly there was no formulated rule of dealing with them changes of religion were so frequent in those days that difficulties when they did arise easily adjusted themselves 
it was considered for example by politicians quite possible at one time that the duke of anjou should conform to the church of england for the sake of marrying the queen or that he should attend public services with her and at the same time have mass and the sacraments in his own private chapel or again it was open to question whether england as a whole would not return to the old religion and catholicism be the only tolerated faith but to really religious minds such solutions would not do it would have been an intolerable thought to this sincere puritan with all his tolerance that his daughter should marry a catholic such an arrangement would mean either that she was indifferent to vital religion or that she was married to a man whose creed she was bound to abhor and anathematize and however willing mr norris might be to meet papists on terms of social friendliness and however much he might respect their personal characters yet the thought that the life of any one dear to him should be irretrievably bound up with all that the catholic creed involved was simply an impossible one besides all this he had no great opinion of hubert he thought he detected in him a carelessness and want of principle that would make him hesitate to trust his daughter to him even if the insuperable barrier of religion were surmounted mr norris liked a man to be consistent and zealous for his creed even if that creed were dark and superstitious and this zeal seemed to him lamentably lacking in hubert more than once he had heard the boy speak of his father with an air of easy indulgence that his own opinion interpreted as contempt i believe my father thinks he had once said that every penny he pays in fines goes to swell the accidental glory of god and hubert had been considerably startled and distressed when the elder man had told him to hold his tongue unless he could speak respectfully of one to whom he owed nothing but love and honour this had happened however more than a year ago and hubert had forgotten it no doubt even if mr norris had not and as for isabel it is exceedingly difficult to say quite what place hubert occupied in her mind she certainly did not know herself much more than that she liked the boy to be near her to hear his footsteps coming along the path from the hall this morning when her father had called up to her that hubert was come it was not so hard to dry her eyes for anthony's departure the clouds had parted a little when she came and found this tall lad smiling shyly at her in the hall as she had sat in the window-seat too during lady maxwell's singing she was far from unconscious that hubert's face was looking at her from the dark corner and as they walked back together her simplicity was not quite so transparent as the boy himself thought again when her father had begun to speak of him just now although she was able to meet his eyes steadily and smilingly yet it was just an effort she had not mentioned hubert herself until her father had named him and in fact it is probably safe to say that during hubert's visit to the north which had lasted three or four months he had made greater progress towards his goal and had begun to loom larger than ever in the heart of this serene grey-eyed girl whom he longed for so irresistibly and now as isabel sat on her bed before kneeling to say her prayers hubert was in her mind even more than anthony she tried to wonder what her father meant and yet only too well she knew that she knew she had forgotten to look into anthony's room where she had cried so bitterly this morning and now she sat wide-eyed and self-questioning as to whether her heavenly love were as lucid and single as it had been and when at last she went down on her knees she entreated the king of love to bless not only her father and her brother anthony who lay under the alderman's roof in far-away london but sir nicholas and lady maxwell and mistress margaret hallam and and hubert and james maxwell his brother 
and to bring them out of the darkness of papistry into the glorious liberty of the children of the gospel end of chapter two chapter three of by what authority by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain london town isabel's visit to london which had been arranged to take place the christmas after anthony's departure to cambridge was full of bewildering experiences to her mr norris from time to time had references to look up in london and divines to consult as to difficult points in his book on the eucharist and this was a favourable opportunity to see mr deering the st paul's lecturer so the two took the opportunity and with a couple of servants drove up to the city one day early in december to the house of alderman merritt the wool merchant and a friend of mr norris's father and for several days both before and after anthony's arrival from cambridge went every afternoon to see the sights the maze of narrow streets of high black and white houses with their ironwork signs leaning forward as if to whisper to one another leaving strips of sky overhead the strange play of lights and shades after nightfall the fantastic groups the incessant roar and rumble of the crowded alleys all the commonplace life of london was like an enchanted picture to her opening a glimpse into an existence of which she had known nothing to live too in the whirl of news that poured in day after day borne by splashed riders and panting horses this was very different to the slow round of country life with rumours and tales floating in mellowed by doubt and lapse of time like pensive echoes from another world for example morning by morning as she came downstairs to dinner there was the ruddy-faced alderman with his fresh budget of news of the north lords northumberland and westmoreland with a catholic force of several thousands among which were two cousins of mrs merritt herself and the old lady nodded her head dolorously in corroboration had marched southwards under the banner of the five wounds and tramped through durham city welcomed by hundreds the cathedral had been entered old richard norton with the banner leading the new communion table had been cast out of doors the english bible and prayer book torn to shreds the old altar reverently carried in from the rubbish heap the tapers rekindled and amid hysterical enthusiasm mass had been said once more in the old sanctuary then they had moved south lord sussex was powerless in york the queen terrified and irresolute alternately storming and crying spain was about to send ships to hartlepool to help the rebels mary stuart would certainly be rescued from her prison at tutbury then mary had been moved to coventry then came a last flare of frightening tales york had fallen mary had escaped elizabeth was preparing to flee and then one morning the alderman's face was brighter it was all a lie he said the revolt had crumbled away my lord sussex was impregnably fortified in york with guns from hull lord pembroke was gathering forces at windsor lords clinton hereford and warwick were converging towards york to relieve the siege and as if to show isabel it was not a mere romance she could see the actual train bands go by up cheapside with the gleam of steel caps and pike heads and the mighty tramp of disciplined feet and the welcoming roar of the swarming crowds then as men's hearts grew lighter the tale of chastisement began to be told and was not finished till long after isabel was home again green after green of the windy northern villages was made hideous by the hanging bodies of the natives and children hid their faces and ran by lest they should see what her grace had done to their father in spite of the holy sacrifice and the piteous banner and the call to fight for the faith the catholics had hung back and hesitated and the catastrophe was complete the religion of london too was a revelation to this country girl 
she went one sunday to st paul's cathedral pausing with her father before they went in to see the new restorations and the truncated steeple struck by lightning eight years before which in spite of the queen's angry urging the citizens had never been able to replace there was a good congregation at the early morning prayer and the organs and the singing were to isabel as the harps and choirs of heaven the canticles were sung to shepherds setting by the men and children of st paul's all in surplices and the dignitaries wore besides their grey fur almuses which had not yet been abolished the grace and dignity of the whole service though to older people who remembered the unreformed worship a bare and miserable affair and to mr norris with his sincere simplicity and spirituality a somewhat elaborate and sensuous mode of honouring god yet to isabel was a first glimpse of what the mystery of worship meant the dim towering arches through which the dusty richly stained sunbeams poured the far-away murmurous melodies that floated down from the glimmering choir the high thin pealing organ all combined to give her a sense of the unfathomable depths of the divine majesty an element that was lacking in the clear-cut personal puritan creed in spite of the tender associations that made it fragrant for her and the love of the saviour that enlightened and warmed it the sight of the crowds outside too in the frosty sunlight gathered round the grey stone pulpit on the north-east of the cathedral and streaming down every alley and lane the packed galleries the gesticulating black figure of the preacher this impressed on her an idea of the power of corporate religion that hours at her own prayer desk or solitary twilight walks under the hall pines or the uneventful divisions of the rector's village sermons had failed to give it was this sunday in london that awakened her quiet soul from the lonely companionship of god to the knowledge of that vast spiritual world of men of which she was but one tiny cell her father observed her quietly and interestedly as they went home together but said nothing beyond an indifferent word or two he was beginning to realize the serious reality of her spiritual life and to dread anything that would even approximate to coming between her soul and her saviour the father and daughter understood one another and were content to be silent together her talks with mrs merritt too left their traces on her mind the alderman's wife for the first time in her life found her views and reminiscences listened to as if they were oracles and she needed little encouragement to pour them out in profusion she was especially generous with her tales of portents and warnings and the girl was more than once considerably alarmed by what she heard while the ladies were alone in the dim firelit parlour on the winter afternoons before the candles were brought in when you were a little child my dear began the old lady one day there was a great burning made everywhere of all the popish images and vestments all but the copes and the altar-cloths that they made into dresses for the minister's new wives and bed-quilts to cover them and there were books and banners and sepulchres and even relics i went out to see the burning at paul's and though i knew it was proper that the old papistry should go yet i was uneasy at the way it was done well went on the old lady glancing about her i was sitting in this very room only a few days after and the air began to grow dark and heavy and all became still there had been two or three cocks crowing and answering one another down by the river and others at a distance and they all ceased and there had been birds chirping on the roof and they ceased and it grew so dark that i laid down my needle and went to the window and there at the end of the street over the houses there was coming a great cloud with wings like a hawk i thought but some said afterwards that when they saw it it had fingers like a man's hand and others said it was like a great tower with battlements however that may be it grew nearer and larger and it was blue and dark 
like that curtain there and there was no wind to stir it for the windows had ceased rattling and the dust was quiet in the streets and still it came on quickly growing as it came and then there came a faraway sound like a heavy wagon or some said like a deep voice complaining and i turned away from the window afraid and there was the cat that had been on a chair down in the corner with her back up staring at the cloud and then she began to run around the room like a mad thing and presently whisked out of the door when i opened it and i went to find mr merritt and he had not come in and all the yard was quiet i could only hear a horse stamp once or twice in the stable and then i was calling out for some one to come the storm broke and the sky was all one dark cloud from side to side for three hours it went on rolling and clapping and the lightning came in through the window that i had darkened and threw the clothes over my head for i had gone to my bed and rolled myself round under the clothes and so it went on and my dear and mrs merritt put her head close to isabel's i prayed to our lady and the saints which i had not done since i was married and asked them to pray god to keep me safe and then at the end came a clap of thunder and a flash of lightning more fearful than all that had gone before and at that very moment so mr merritt told me when he came in two of the doors in st denis church in fanshawe street were broken in pieces by something that crushed them in and the stone steeple of all hallowed church in brett street was broken off short and a part of it killed a dog that was beneath and overthrew a man that played with the dog isabel could hardly restrain a shiver and a glance round the dark old room so awful were mrs merritt's face and gestures and loud whispering tone as she told this ah but my dear she went on there was worse happen to poor king hal god rest him him who had began to reform the church as they say and destroyed the monasteries all the money that he left for masses for his soul was carried off with the rest at the change of religion and that was bad enough but this is worse this is a tale my dear that i have heard my father tell many a time and i was a young woman myself when it happened the king's grace was threatened by a friar i think of greenwich that if he laid hands on the monasteries he should be as ahab whose blood was licked by dogs in the very place which he took from a man well the friar was hanged for his pains and the king lived and then at last he died and was put in a great coffin and carried through london and they put the coffin in an open space in sion abbey which the king had taken and in the night there came one to view the coffin and to see that all was well and he came round a corner and there stood the great coffin for his grace was a great stout man my dear on trestles in the moonlight and beneath it a great black dog that lapped something and the dog turned as the man came and some say but not my father that the dog's eyes were red as coals and that his mouth and nostrils smoked and that he cast no shadow but however that may be the dog turned and looked and then ran and the man followed him into a yard but when he reached there there was no dog and the man went back to the coffin afraid and he, he found the coffin was burst open and and mrs merritt stopped abruptly isabel was white and trembling there there my dear i am a foolish old woman and I, i'll tell you no more isabel was really terrified and entreated mrs merritt to tell her something pleasant to make her forget these horrors and so she told her old tales of her youth and the sights of the city and the great doings in mary's reign and so the time passed pleasantly till the gentlemen came home at other times she told her of elizabeth and the great nobles and isabel's heart beat high at it 
and at the promise that before she left she herself should see the queen even if she had to go to greenwich or nonsuch for it god bless her said mrs merritt loyally she's a woman like ourselves for all her majesty and she likes the show and the music too like us all i declare when i see them all a-going down the water to greenwich or to the tower for a bear-baiting with the horns blowing and the guns firing and the banners and the barges and the music i declare sometimes i think that heaven itself can be no better god forgive me ah but i wish her grace would take a husband there are many that want her and then we could laugh at them all there's so many against her grace now who'd be for her if she had a son of her own there's duke charles whose picture hangs in her bedroom they say and lord robert dudley there's a handsome spark my dear in his gay coat and his feathers and his ruff and his hand on his hip and his horse and all i wish she'd take him and have done with it and then we'd hear no more of the nasty spaniards there's don de silva for all the world like a monkey with his brown face and mincing ways and his grand clothes i declare when captain hawkins came home just four years ago last michaelmas and came up to london with his men all laughing and rolling along with the people cheering them i could have kissed the man to think how he had made the brown men dance and curse and show their white teeth and to think that the don had to ask him to dinner and grin and chatter as if naught had happened and mrs merritt's good-humoured face broke into mirth at the thought of the ambassador's impotence and duplicity anthony's arrival in london a few days before christmas removed the one obstacle to isabel's satisfaction that he was not there to share it with her the two went about together most of the day under their father's care when he was not busy at his book and saw all that was to be seen one afternoon as they were just leaving the courtyard of the tower which they had been visiting with a special order a slight reddish-haired man who came suddenly out of a doorway of the white tower stopped a moment irresolutely and then came towards them bareheaded and bowing he had sloping shoulders and a serious-looking mouth with a reddish beard and moustache and had an air of strangely mingled submissiveness and capability his voice too as he spoke was at once deferential and decided i ask your pardon mr norris he said perhaps you do not remember me i have seen you before said the other puzzled for a moment yes sir said the man down at great keynes i was in service at the hall sir yes yes said mr norris i remember you perfectly a uh, lackington is it not the man bowed again i left about eight years ago sir and by the blessing of god have gained a little post under the government but i wish to tell you sir that i have been happily led to change my religion i was a papist sir you know mr norris congratulated him i thank you sir said lackington the two children were looking at him and he turned to them and bowed again mistress isabel and master anthony sir is it not i remember you said isabel a little shyly at least i think so lackington bowed again as if gratified and turned to their father if you are leaving mr norris would you allow me to walk with you a few steps i have much i would like to ask you of my old master and mistress the four passed out together the two children in front and as they went lackington asked most eagerly after the household at the hall and especially after mr james for whom he seemed to have a special affection it is rumoured said mr norris that he is going abroad indeed sir said the servant with a look of great interest i had heard it too sir but did not know whether to believe it lackington also gave many messages of affection to others of the household to peers the bailiff and a couple of the foresters and finished by entreating mr norris to use him as he would telling him how anxious he was to be of service to his friends and asking to be entrusted with any little errands or commissions in london that the country gentleman might wish performed 
i shall count it sir a privilege said the servant and you shall find me prompt and discreet one curious incident took place just as lackington was taking his leave at the turning down into wharf street a man hurrying eastward almost ran against them and seemed on the point of apologizing but his face changed suddenly and he spat furiously on the ground mumbling something and hurried on lackington seemed to see nothing why did he do that interrupted mr norris astonished i ask your pardon sir said lackington interrogatively that fellow did you not see him spit at me i did not observe it sir said the servant and presently took his leave why did that man spit at you father asked isabel when they had come indoors i cannot think my dear i have never seen him in my life i think lackington knew said anthony with a shrewd air lackington why lackington did not even see him that was just it said anthony anthony's talk about cambridge during these first evenings in london was fascinating to isabel if not to their father it concerned of course himself and his immediate friends and dealt with such subjects as cock-fighting a good deal but he spoke also of the public disputations and the theological champions who crowed and pecked not unlike cocks themselves while the theatre rang with applause and hooting the sport was one of the most popular at the universities at this time but above all his tales of the queen's visit a few years before attracted the girl for was she not to see the queen with her own eyes oh father said the lad i would i had been there five years ago when she came master taylor told me of it they acted the aulularia you know in the king's chapel on the sunday evening master taylor took a part i forget what and he told me how she laughed and clapped and then there was a great disputation before her one day in st mary's church and the doctors argued i forget about what but master taylor says that of course the genevans had the best of it and the queen spoke too in latin though she did not wish to but my lord of ely persuaded her to it so you see she could not have learned it by heart as some said and she said she would give some great gift to the university but master taylor says they're still waiting for it but it must come soon you see because it is the queen's grace who has promised it but master taylor says he hopes she has forgotten it but he laughs when i ask him what he means and says it again who is this master taylor asked his father oh he's a fellow of king's said anthony and he told me about the provost too the provost is half a papist they say he's very old now and he has buried all the vessels and the vestments of the chapel they say somewhere where no one knows and he hopes the old religion will come back again some day and then he will dig them up but that is papistry and no one wants that at cambridge and others say that he is a papist altogether and has a priest in his house sometimes but i do not think he can be a papist because he was there when the queen was there bowing and smiling says master taylor and looking on the queen so earnestly as if he worshipped her says master taylor all the time the chancellor was talking to her before they went into the chapel for the te deum but they wished they had kept some of the things like the provost says master taylor because they were much put to it when her grace came down for stuffs to cover the communion tables and for surplices for cecil said she would be displeased if all was bare and poor is it true father asked anthony breaking off that the queen likes popish things and has a crucifix and tapers on the table in her chapel ah oh, my son said mr norris smiling you must ask one who knows and what else happened well said anthony the best is to come they had plays you know the dido and one called ezekius before the queen oh and she sent for one of the boys they say and and kissed him they say but i think that cannot be true well my son go on oh and some of them thought they would have one more play before she went but she had to go a long journey and left cambridge before they could do it and they went after her to uh, to audley end i think where she was to sleep and a room was made ready and when all was prepared 
though her grace was tired she came in to see the play master taylor was not there he said he would rather not act in that one but he had the story from one who acted but no one knew he said who wrote the play well when the queen's grace was seated the actors came on dressed father dressed and anthony's eyes began to shine with amusement as the catholic bishops in the tower there was bonner in his popish vestments some say they had from st bennet's with a staff and his tall mitre and a lamb in his arms and he stared at it and, and gnashed his teeth at it as he tramped in and then came the others all like bishops all in mass vestments or cloth cut to look like them and then at the end came a dog that belonged to one of them well trained with the popish host in his mouth made large and white so that all could see what it was well they thought the queen would laugh as she was a protestant but no one laughed someone said something in the room and a lady cried out and then the queen stood up and scolded the actors and trounced them well with her tongue she did and said she was displeased and then out she went with all her ladies and gentlemen after her except one or two servants who put out the lights at once without waiting and broke bonner's staff and took away the host and kicked the dog and told them to be off for the queen's grace was angered with them and so they had to get back to cambridge in the dark as well as they might oh the poor boys said mrs merritt and they did it all to please her grace too yes said the alderman but the queen thought it enough i dare say to put the bishops in prison without allowing boys to make a mock of them and their faith before her yes said anthony i thought that was it when the alderman came in a day or two later with the news that elizabeth was to come up from nonsuch the next day and to pass down cheapside on her way to greenwich the excitement of isabel and anthony was indescribable cheapside was joyous to see as the two with their father behind them talking to a minister whose acquaintance he had made sat at a first-floor window soon after midday waiting to see the queen go by many of the people had hung carpets or tapestries some of taffetas and cloth of gold out of their balconies and windows and the very signs themselves fantastic ironwork with here and there a grotesque beast rampant or a bright painting or an escutcheon with the gay good-tempered crowds beneath and the strip of frosty blue sky crossed by streamers from side to side shining above the towering eaves and gables of the houses all combined to make a scene so astonishing that it seemed scarcely real to these country children it was yet some time before she was expected but there came a sudden stir from the upper end of cheapside and then a burst of cheering and laughter and hoots anthony leaned out to see what was coming but could make out nothing beyond the head of a horse and a man driving it from the seat of a cart coming slowly down the centre of the road the laughter and noise grew louder as the crowds swayed this way and that to make room presently it was seen that behind the cart a little space was kept and anthony made out the grey head of a man at the tail of the cart and the face of another a little way behind then at last as the cart jolted past the two children saw a man stripped to the waist his hands tied before him to the cart his back one red wound while a hangman walked behind whirling his thonged whip about his head and bringing it down now and again on the old man's back at each lash the prisoner shrank away and turned his piteous face drawn with pain from side to side while the crowd yelled and laughed what's it for what's it for inquired anthony eager and interested a boy leaning from the next window answered him he said jesus christ was not in heaven at that moment a humorist near the cart began to cry out way for the king's grace way for the king's grace and the crowd took the idea instantly a few men walking with the cart formed lines like gentlemen ushers uncovering their heads and all crying out the same words and one eager player tried to walk backwards until he was tripped up 
and so the dismal pageant of this red-robed king of anguish went by and the hoots and shouts of his heralds died away anthony turned to isabel exultant and interested why isabel he said you look all white what is it you know he's a blasphemer i know i know said isabel then suddenly far away came the sound of trumpets and gusts of distant cheering like the sound of the wind in thick foliage anthony leaned out again and an excited murmur broke out once more as all faces turned westwards a moment more and anthony caught a flash of colour from the corner near st paul's churchyard then the shrill trumpet sounded nearer and the cheering broke out at the end and ran down the street like a wave of noise from every window faces leaned out even on the roofs and between the high chimney-pots were swaying figures masses of colour now began to emerge with the glitter of steel round the bend of the street where the winter sunshine fell and the crowds began to surge back and against the houses at first anthony could make out little but two moving rippling lines of light coming parallel pressing the people back and it was not until they had come opposite the window that he could make out the steel caps and pike-heads of men in half-armour who marching two and two with a space between them led the procession and kept the crowds back there they went with immovable disciplined faces grounding their pike butts sharply now and again caring nothing for the yelp of pain that sometimes followed immediately behind them came the aldermen in scarlet on black horses that tossed their jingling heads as they walked anthony watched the solemn faces of the old gentleman with a good deal of awe and presently made out his friend mr merritt who rode near the end but who was too much engrossed in the management of his horse to notice the two children who cried out to him and waved the sergeants of arms followed and then two lines again of gentlemen pensioners walking bareheaded carrying wands in short cloaks and elaborate ruffs but the lad saw little of them for the splendour of the lords and knights that followed eclipsed them altogether the knights came first in steel armour with raised visors the horses too in armour moving sedately with a splendid clash of steel and twinkling fiercely in the sunshine and then after them and anthony drew his breath swiftly came a blaze of colour and jewels as the great lords in their cloaks and feathered caps metal clasped and gemmed came on their splendid long-maned horses the crowd yelled and cheered and great names were tossed to and fro as the owners passed on each talking to his fellow as if unconscious of the tumult and even of the presence of these shouting thousands the cry of the trumpets rang out again high and shattering as the trumpeters and heralds and rich coat armour came next and anthony looked a moment fascinated by the lions and lilies and the brightness of the eloquent horns before he turned his head to see the lord mayor himself mounted on a great stately white horse that needed no management while his rider bore on a cushion the sceptre ah she was coming near now the two saw nothing of the next rider who carried aloft the glittering sword of state for their eyes were fixed on the six plumed heads of the horses with grooms and footmen in cassock coats and venetian hose and the great gilt open carriage behind that swayed and jolted over the cobbles she was here she was here and the loyal crowds yelled and surged to and fro and the cloths and handkerchiefs flapped and waved and caps tossed up and down as at last the great creaking carriage came under the window this is what they saw in it a figure of extraordinary dignity sitting upright and stiff like a pagan idol dressed in a magnificent and fantastic purple robe with a great double ruff like a huge collar behind her head a long taper waist voluminous skirts spread all over the cushions embroidered with curious figures and creatures over her shoulders but opened in front so as to show the ropes of pearls and the blaze of jewels on the stomacher 
was a purple velvet mantle lined with ermine with pearls sewn into it here and there set far back on her head over a pile of reddish yellow hair drawn tightly back from the forehead was a hat with curled brims elaborately embroidered with the jewelled outline of a little crown in front and a high feather topping all and her face a long oval pale and transparent in complexion with a sharp chin and a high forehead high arched eyebrows auburn but a little darker than her hair her mouth was small rising at the corners with thin curved lips tightly shut and her eyes which were clear in colour looked incessantly about her with great liveliness and good humour there was something overpowering to these two children who looked too awed to cheer in this formidable figure in the barbaric dress the gorgeous climax of a gorgeous pageant apart from the physical splendour this solitary glittering creature represented so much it was the incarnate genius of the laughing brutal wanton english nation that sat here in the gilded carriage and smiled and glanced with tight lips and clear eyes she was like some emblematic giant moving in a processional car as fantastic as itself dominant and serene above the heads of the maddened crowds on to some mysterious destiny a sovereign however personally inglorious has such a dignity in some measure and elizabeth added to this an exceptional majesty of her own henry would not have been ashamed for this daughter of his what wonder then that these crowds were delirious with love and loyalty and an exultant fear as this overwhelming personality went by this pale-faced tranquil virgin queen passionate wanton outspoken and absolutely fearless with a sufficient reserve of will to be fickle without weakness and sufficient grasp of her aims to be indifferent to her policy untouched by vital religion financially shrewd inordinately vain and when this strange dominant creature royal by character as by birth as strong as her father and as wanton as her mother sat in ermine and velvet and pearls in a royal carriage with shrewd-faced wits and bright-eyed lovers and solemn statesmen and great nobles vacuous and gallant glittering and jingling before her and troops of tall ladies in ruff and crimson mantle riding on white horses behind and when the fanfares went shattering down the street vibrating through the continuous roar of the crowd and the shrill cries of children and the mellow thunder of church bells rocking overhead and the endless tramp of a thousand feet below and when the whole was framed in this fantastic twisted street blazing with tapestries and arched with gables and banners all bathed in glory by the clear frosty sunshine it is little wonder that for a few minutes at least this country boy felt that here at last was the incarnation of his dreams and that his heart should exult with an enthusiasm he could not interpret for the cause of a people who could produce such a queen and of a queen who could rule such a people and that his imagination should be fired with a sudden sense that these were causes for which the sacrifice of a life would be counted cheap if they might thereby be furthered yet in this very moment by one of those mysterious suggestions that rise from the depth of a soul the image sprang into his mind and poised itself there for an instant of the grey-haired man who had passed half an hour ago sobbing and shrinking at the cart's tail End of chapter three